I'm going to introduce myself real quick. My name is Eric Olson. I'm the director of Extension Lakes, um, and I'm very happy to see you all here today. Uh, I do want to point out there are some people standing in the back. Um, this is our morning program. We have a plenary program and a panel coming up, and I'd encourage you while the lights are still up to find your way towards the front. We've got muffins and danishes on the table. We have coffee set out for people, so please uh, come enjoy a seat somewhere. Um, I'm also going to invite my panelists now to kind of join on the table while the lights are still up so that we can find our way here. Um, I'll introduce them after this short video. The next thing we're going to do is, is sort of a bit of a convention tradition. Um, and I can't help, I can't thank Amy Kowalski enough for sticking with me on this one because I kind of put her through the ringer to get this one uh, assembled at the very last minute. These videos that we show are really meant to help set the mood and try to kind of put a marker out for what each year's convention was about and what were the things we talked about. And as you've heard, this year we're talking about trust and this morning we're specifically talking about the public trust doctrine. And so it only seems fair to hear some of the voices of the public trust doctrine. It's, it's something that I think for anyone in this room who doesn't know much about the trust doctrine, you're gonna know a lot more when this panel is completed, but it starts with our constitution of the state of Wisconsin, and it concludes with all the things that follow our, our court cases, our law, and as we'll talk today, sort of our practices in the field. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Amy and the video. The state shall have concurrent jurisdiction on all rivers and lakes bordering on this state so far as such rivers or lakes shall form a common boundary to the state and any other state or territory now or hereafter to be formed and bounded by the same. And the river Mississippi and the navigable waters leading into the Mississippi and St. Lawrence and the carrying places between the same shall be common highways and forever free as well to the inhabitants of the state as to the citizens of the United States without any tax, impost, or duty therefore. The wisdom of the policy which, in the organic laws of our state, steadfastly and carefully preserved to the people the full and free use of public waters cannot be questioned, nor should it be limited or curtailed by narrow constructions. It should be interpreted in the broad and beneficent spirit that gave rise to it, in order that the people may fully enjoy the intended benefits. The right of the citizens of the state to enjoy our navigable streams for recreational purposes, including the enjoyment of scenic beauty, is a legal right that is entitled to all. Is the ownership of a parcel of land so absolute that man can change its nature to suit any of his purposes? The great forests of our state were stripped on the theory that man's ownership was unlimited. But in forestry, the land at least was used naturally, only the natural fruit of the land, the trees, were taken. The despoilage was in the failure to look to the future and provide for the reforestation of the land. An owner of land has no absolute and unlimited right to change the essential natural character of his land so as to use it for a purpose for which it was unsuited in its natural state and which injures the rights of others. The exercise of the police power in zoning must be reasonable and we think it is not an unreasonable exercise of that power to prevent harm to public rights by limiting the use of private property to its natural uses. The legislature finds environmental values, wildlife, public rights and navigable waters, and the public welfare are threatened by the deterioration of public lakes that the protection and rehabilitation of the public inland lakes of this state are in the best interests of the citizens of this state, that the public health and welfare will be benefited thereby, that the current state effort to abate water pollution will not undo the eutrophic and other deteriorated conditions of many lakes, that lakes form an important basis of the state's recreation industry, that the increasing recreational usage of the waters of this state justifies state action to enhance and restore the potential of our inland lakes to satisfy the needs of the citizenry, and that the positive public duty of this state as trustee of waters requires affirmative steps to protect and enhance this resource and protect environmental values.
I want to give an extra shout out to uh, Dan Zur and Aaron Burkett, who are here in the audience today for doing the last minute recording of the audio reading from uh, the Constitution, those court cases, and uh, our state law. I want to quickly introduce our panelists today. Um, joining us to my left is Mike Engelson, who we've already met. He's the executive director of Wisconsin Lakes. To his left is Lynn Markham. Lynn is a colleague of mine at UW Stevens Point. She's an employee of the Center for Land Use Education, where she focuses uh, a much of her work on shoreland zoning and boards of adjustment across Wisconsin. And to her left is Michael Kane. Michael Kane was a longtime attorney with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and now he volunteers with a Wisconsin Green Fire to help uh, basically do what we're doing today, educate the public and educate lawmakers about the importance of the public trust doctrine. So thank you uh, for joining us. Can we give them a warm Wisconsin welcome, please? So um, yesterday, some of you were in a all day uh, workshop related to the public trust doctrine and these three uh, were there as well. I was not there. I was in other workshops pretty much all day working on uh, talking about lake districts. So I'm kind of, this is my opportunity to basically find out what happened in this day long workshop and to kind of pick the brains of these three people. Um, we will probably have a little bit of time towards the end for your questions and answers as well. Um, but we basically wanted to keep this a fairly informal discussion about what might be sort of a cryptic concept or topic, the public trust doctrine. I would hazard to guess that of the millions of residents of the state of Wisconsin, only a small fraction of them ever wake up and think about the public trust doctrine, but it's been hinted that this thing, this concept underlies much of what we do to protect our lakes. I'm going to start off with just a real quick question to Michael Keane. Uh, Secretary Payne mentioned that these, the public trust doctrine has its roots uh, back to 1787. And yet, as we saw, the, the Wisconsin Constitution was not really brought about until the 19th century. Can you explain a bit what, what that connection is to 1787? Well, the um... Wisconsin was carved out of the Northwest Territories, and the, the language that's in Article 9, Section 1 of the Wisconsin Constitution was actually taken verbatim from uh, the, the Northwest Ordinance, which established the Northwest Territories, which basically established that, you know, in all of the states that are carved out of, of the Northwest Territories, which is Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, um, you know, the waters shall be common highways and forever free to all citizens of the state and of the United States. Um, and so based on that language in the Wisconsin Constitution, uh, there was a body of common law that has developed through court cases starting in the, in the, uh, you know, the mid 1800s, uh, where the legislature at one point tried to give the bed of uh, Big Muskego Lake to a developer and the Wisconsin Supreme Court struck that law down and said that the legislature has no more authority to give that land, um, that lake bed to a private developer than it does to give the capital or the school fund for a private purpose. And there's been a lot of cases since then. Um, some of the early cases dealt with uh, Frank Wade fishing on the Willow River. Um, and there was a question at the time, some people out of the Twin Cities bought land on both sides of the Willow River, which is a great trout stream in, in Northeast Wisconsin said, we own that, the land, nobody can fish it. He took his, uh, he waded in, caught some fish, got arrested, went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and they said, no, this is a public right. Nobody owns the water. Nobody owns the fish. You have a right. The Diana Shooting Club, which was mentioned here, um, Virgil Houston, who was a, a lawyer, um, they lived near the Horicon Marsh. Some people from Milwaukee and Chicago had purchased large portions of the Horicon Marsh and said, this is our hunting club. Nobody can come in here. Um, you know, he was a, a local lawyer and became a state senator, and he took his... Uh, his boat down the river, the Rock River, uh, shot some birds, got arrested, took it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know, this is in 1914, said, absolutely, this is a public right. And there's there's a, a, a long list of cases. Wisconsin is recognized by uh, legal scholars, Joseph Sachs, who used to be at the University of Michigan and then went to Berkeley Law School, uh, wrote an article and said that Wisconsin was the leading state in developing the public trust doctrine. I spent my career, uh, 34 years for DNR, working on those issues, um, and we're still leading the country. Uh, there are cases going to the Supreme Court uh, still routinely dealing with these issues, and uh, we obviously can't talk about them all today, but we spent a lot of time talking about them yesterday. Um, and I don't know if you're going to get into this, but um, yesterday we started with Professor Melissa Scanlon, 
Uh, she is currently the head of the uh, Center for Water Policy at UW-Milwaukee. Um, she's the founder of Midwest Environmental Advocates. Uh, she then went and taught at Vermont Law School. She now has come back to, um, you know, to UWM. And um, I've worked with um, and, and crossed swords at times with Melissa over the years. Um, you know, she's brilliant. And she started uh, back in 1998. Uh, she was concerned about whether the Department of Natural Resources was properly carrying out the trust doctrine and had the resources to do it. And so, you, so she um, interviewed Department Waterway staff, which is the program that I worked in, and administrators, and wrote a somewhat scathing article uh, about, you know, the, didn't feel that we were doing as much as we should. We had twice the staff then of both attorneys and, and field staff that we have now. Uh, she has done that every 10 years, and she just, her third article is being published in the Berkeley Law Review um, next month, and so she was talking about, um, you know, where things stand now. And yep. We're actually going to hear from her in a little bit from one of her videos. So okay. we're going to pick up sort of her analysis of what's been happening, particularly in the last uh, a few years, last dozen or so years. I want to go back to what you said about, you know, the the, um, the language in the Constitution. And I want to pick on a little bit. It said common highways and forever free. What did that mean for people practically in the 1840s, 1850s? What what? How did we use rivers back then? And how might that contrast to how we're using waterways today? Yeah, well, I think, you know, initially at, you know, at statehood, uh, they were our, our highways. You know, people were, were floating logs to market. The, they were carrying skins and whatnot. And, and that was basically how people moved around the state. And so originally that was the foundation and that's what people looked at. That has evolved over time as we, you know, and the courts have recognized, uh, you know, that we are now using our waterways for many other things. And they say that, you know, any sort of public recreation has been recognized as a public right. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources in the state has a responsibility to look at the cumulative impacts. And we're obviously seeing with the, the burgeoning development and the, the number of watercraft and the size of watercraft, we're seeing changes. We obviously have seen changes in water quality impacts from PFAS and the things that were happening, um, you know, during the industrialization in the Wisconsin River. Um, and so things have changed, but the, you know, the, the trust doctrine has changed along with them and has evolved. Mike Engelson, I want to ask you, you've been hearing, I think, from a lot of lake constituents about some of these newer uses that Michael Kane just hinted at, uh, recreational conflicts and the volume of conflicts. Talk about some of the challenges you're facing when you, when you have these conversations with groups and why it's not so easy just to kind of go out and say, well, let's just ban this use altogether. Yeah, sure. Is this working? I think so. Um, so I think, uh, as Michael kind of mentioned, there has been a, um, a, a an allowance that the public trust allows for recreation that really hasn't been filled out very much. So this is, uh, uh I think in legal terms, almost a, a bit of a novel issue, because if you think about it at the time that case, um, the, the last time that case was decided, that was at least back in the, the, the one in the 70s that dealt with that yeah so that the horsepower for the motors that were being used was a lot smaller than it is right now um not everybody and every college student owned a kayak um there's a lot more stuff going on on our waters now um and that has led to to conflicts with the uh, a number of watercraft that are on the water and then the different things that those watercraft are doing and other ways that people are interacting with their waters. And so we haven't really dealt with that uh, as a state um, to figure out exactly how these rights interplay and how one person's right impacts um, another person's right. And this, this right to have to enjoy recreational activities on lakes um, is really only as useful as people have access to lakes, which is to say, you know, we have a system of public landings, of public property, parks, state parks, and local parks that all provide that access, but is that access sufficient for the population of today when we think about, you know, over five million people and I don't know how many millions of tourists, and yet every time someone talks about creating a new boat landing or expanding public access, it seems like we run into a, a tension there. Sure, and there's a problem, um, there, there's a definite tension there because there are um, people and populations of the state that 
have been um, historically precluded from being able to get access. Um, and there are water bodies that have different sizes of access, but you also run into the problem that I was just talking about, that as you expand that access, you have problems of, the, of traffic on the waters and you get lots of problems with environmental impact and uh, um, personal safety and enjoyment. And uh, um, I think one of the things that we're trying to do here is begin this conversation because I don't necessarily have the answer um, to this. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a tough problem. Great. We're going to come back to where we go next towards the end. I want to see if I can cue up from Amy. Amy's behind the screen. She's our Wizard of Oz back there. We have a video that does sort of recap some of what Melissa Scanlon was talking about. And I want to use that to launch into a discussion of kind of what, what was discussed yesterday and, and where we're at today. We are drawn to water to live, work, and play. For over a century, Wisconsin has reflected that importance in a body of law known as the Public Trust Doctrine. The doctrine establishes the state as a trustee over our shared rights to enjoy water resources. Yes, when it comes to water, every cheesehead is a trust fund kid. Throughout my career, I have studied how Wisconsin's water trustees at the Department of Natural Resources implement this doctrine, manage uncertainty, and confront complex challenges. Over the past decade, Wisconsin's legislature reduced the DNR's authority, made it much more difficult for the DNR to update administrative rules, loosened controls over building homes close to the water, and cut funding, resulting in fewer water managers to enforce water protection laws. Recent years have brought one wake-up call after another. During the COVID-19 pandemic, public demand for water resources dramatically increased. Meanwhile, climate change is bringing us greater extremes, yet trustees are less able to respond when a crisis hits. Lake Michigan's water level dramatically went from a record low in 2013 to a record high in 2020. With buildings too close to the shore, the high water inundated some communities and eroded the ground beneath others. Hundreds of coastal landowners took action to armor the coast, often without permits. Inexperienced contractors came out of the woodwork and took advantage. Some property owners filled the lake bed to extend their property. Others added inappropriate materials such as building debris. Since DNR trustees lacked the staff and authority to respond in a timely manner, owners realized they could act first and get permission later. Some structures washed away in one storm. Now that the water is receding, shoreline armor is high and dry, an eyesore, a threat to fish and wildlife habitats, and an obstruction on the shoreline. To avoid similar problems in the future, Wisconsin and other coastal states should reconsider allowing homes close to shore or in flood-prone areas, invest in enough water managers to respond in times of crisis, and give them the legal tools to protect the common good. While the future is uncertain, the water always wins. So to my knowledge, that's the first ecology law quarterly article to be translated into an animated video. But when I talked to Melissa about this, she pointed out that this, this article is something like 50 or 60 pages long. It's not 82 uh, pages. 82 pages. Uh, it's, it's not light reading. It's not really geared to the way people get information today, but she really wanted to put this video out there, at least to try to get the major points across. Lynn, I'm gonna ask you, one of the major points seem to be around staffing, the, the resource and capacity of both the department and maybe even local government to actually carry out the duties of the trust. Can you reflect on how you've seen that change over your career in Wisconsin? Sure. Um, first of all, even though that paper that's coming out right now that's available online is 82 pages, when Eric asked me to be on this panel, it was like, it's time to read this and the one before it and maybe the one before that. And they're fascinating. If you like to read about people and their experiences working with landowners, working with politicians, 
they're great. I stayed up late a number of nights reading these. I highly recommend them. I can get you the links if you need them. Basically, my summary of DNR staff and what they said is it's very difficult to do their job now. They're overwhelmed by workload. Um, they've had, like Secretary Payne said, they can enforce the laws that are on the books. And in some cases, those laws aren't sufficient at this point in time in order to protect the resource, to uphold the public trust doctrine. Um, so it's both a matter of staffing and the laws that they have to work with. Their staffing has gone down significantly. They're treading water, as I understand it. Um, they also talk about, I kind of appreciated this, that every property owner that you talk to about the project on their property views themselves as the good guy, the good person in terms of their project will be good. And one of the DNR staff said, but think about it from the fish's perspective. Is that sand blanket, is that you know home rebuilt close to the shore, is keeping your, your shoreline as grass rather than trees and native plants, is that good for the fish? Or is it just good for the people living there? So I think trying to think about it from a fish's perspective. Related to education, I do this with elementary and junior high students all the time and actually county board members like it too. We show different shorelines and we say, what's good for the fish? Could you survive as a small fish here? Could you survive as the Northern Pike that's two months old and only two inches long? Is there any cover? Is there any food? Was your egg ever even gonna hatch or is there too much erosion happening that you wouldn't be two inches long? Um, thinking about the county staff, um, both the county land and water staff that were mentioned just a little bit ago, as well as the county zoning staff, we haven't so much seen large cuts in numbers in those positions. Some counties have, um, but I would say most counties not. But what we have seen is a large turnover in who those people are getting a very new staff. Um, we just had a zoning leadership program a couple of months ago. Um, this is something that Eric started back in the early 2000s um, and it's grown. This year we have 30 new zoning staff from county offices across the state. Um, all but two of them have been in their positions for less than two years. So I would encourage you to get to know these people, to support these people, to support their training, to work with them, to learn about lakes. Um, and maybe you could pair up with one of them to be part of our lake leaders program. Um, that could be an option, a way to learn more if you haven't been through lake leaders and help your local staff learn more about lakes from many different perspectives. Awesome. Now, Mike, Lynn hit on, hit on the, the budget cuts and the video mentioned this as well. And I don't have the statistic in front of me, but it's my understanding that really starting with Governor Doyle and probably extending and accelerating through Governor Walker, the water portion of the Wisconsin DNR disproportionately was targeted for budget cuts. Does that resonate with what you understand of, of how that happened? Or maybe Michael Kane, do you remember what the kind of disproportionate impact was? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that I would wanna make a public statement without having looked at the data a little more. I used to be an attorney, uh, but, but anecdotally, at least that, that I feel like that tracks. Yeah. So I can, I can, I can add a little bit. Um, and I don't know all of the precise details either. Um, uh, but, um, in the program that I worked in, they have about half the staff now that they did when I was there. And we were criticized by Professor Scanlon and others at that time for not, had, not doing the job. And we were doing the best we could with the resources we had. Um, they have less attorneys, they have less field staff. And I, one thing I want to discuss a little bit, Professor Scanlon in the latest article talked about political interference, um, you know, and, and Secretary Payne talked about this. Um, I was at the Department of Natural Resources that I graduated from UW-Stevens Point with a degree in biology in 1972. George Becker, one of my professors here, sued the DNR, he lost. 
Um, that made me want to go to law school. Um, I started uh, law school in 1973. I started clerking for the department then with a the goal of becoming a water lawyer at the DNR, which I succeeded in doing. But I worked over the course of my career, I worked through uh, seven secretaries and seven governors. And through that period of time, um, from my perspective, there was very little political interference. There was always calls from the legislature, but the department staff was allowed to do their work. Um, you know, during the, and this isn't partisan, but this is just fact, that, you know, during the Doyle administration, there seemed to be a little more influence from the governor's office, uh, overruling sometimes uh, department, you know, scientist decisions, et cetera. Um, I retired from the department. I was sort of happily retired. Um, during the Walker administration, I got a, a permit sent to me, the Meteor Timber Permit over in Toma, a sand, sand fracking operation where the department had authorized the filling of 16 acres of wetlands. And I looked at the permit and I said, this was drafted as a, as a denial. This permit doesn't make any sense. The conditions in the permit are requiring them to submit information that you need, the foundational information you would need to review the permit. So I picked up the phone and called a bunch of DNR staff and they said, well, if we had the temerity to say that shouldn't be issued, we were taken off the, the project. And eventually a manager signed the permit um, I talked to former Secretary George Meyer, and he and I went and testified to the legislature about what was going on. We went to the public hearing and we testified uh, to the administrative law judge that this should not be issued. Um, for a lot of reasons, it was denied. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, I'm really happy to say that that has changed. Um, you know, under the current governor and the current administration, a lot of those issues have been addressed. But I personally, um, you know, I was offended by what had happened there, and I, I couldn't believe as a Wisconsin citizen that that was happening in Wisconsin. Um, and I think all of us have to be aware of that. Um, we all have a lot of different opinions, and these are difficult questions. But, you know, one of the reasons I'm now with Green Fire is that, you know, we need to have scientists um, and engineers and, and people making those decisions, and we need to have the department standing behind them. And I think that's happening again. But uh, we all need to be vigilant. Lynn, you mentioned taking the fish's perspective, looking at the landscape, but I'm also wondering, you know, do landowners often just even take the perspective of the water resource manager, the staff person from the DNR who might be coming out to the property to appreciate how hard that job must be to go to dozens or hundreds of properties and generally have to be the person trying to, trying to say, well, no, this you can't do exactly what you dream to do here. That seems like a very unforgiving job. And did I get a sense from the article that turnover in those positions can be pretty dramatic? Correct. Um, the turnover for the water management specialist can be quite high. Um, part of it is short staffing. Part of it is the difficulty of the job. Um, we're going to show a video in a few minutes talking a little bit about shoreland zoning. I'm working on a second video um, that goes into more depth talking about why do we have shoreland setbacks? Why do we have shoreland buffers? Why do we have impervious surface limits? And I think, you know, a lot of people just don't understand that. But part of what we're talking about in the second video is process. And we're trying to help people understand that going to talk to the county zoning office or going to talk to your DNR staff member, depending on what project you're looking at, if you're land word of the ordinary high water mark, that's county zoning. If you're water word, that's DNR staff. But going to talk to them early in the process, not coming in with a complete plan and here's the entire floor plan and it has to go here. But rather early in the process, here's why I bought my lake property. Here's what I wanna do, whether it's building an initial home or expanding a home and what are my options? and working with staff on options versus being tied to one option and trying to push that through. Um, the flip side of that is I work on training with county boards of adjustment. Um, so they're the ones that decide on variances, um, whether you can build closer to the lake than what the ordinance says. Um, and so that's a piece too. There are legal standards there. Um, in order to make legally defensible decisions, the zoning boards aren't to grant everything just because someone would like to build closer, but only in specific situations where they meet the legal standards for a variance. 
just an ongoing challenge too, to work with those appointed officials on boards of adjustment and keep them up to speed with what their roles are. Mike, uh, Mike Engelson, the, the budget issue was mentioned and the secretary mentioned the idea that we could potentially see an increase in funding for these things. I think of everybody up on the stage, you're the only one who actually can lobby the legislature, but of the people in this room, there may be other people who could actually influence lawmakers what sort of message would you share with people about how to contact lawmakers related to budgets and related to kind of where we're at in that budget process as well, the timeline? Sure. I, I think what, to kind of bring the public trust into this too, I think a message that can be brought to the, uh, to, the leg to your legislators as you talk to them um, and whether you, uh, you know, whether it's a phone call or a, a handwritten letter or an email, it is really important to, to get to know your legislators, even if you don't agree with them or don't think that they're going to do anything for you, because they are, um, and especially their staff will, should listen to you as a constituent. Um, and the more people that talk, the more an issue comes up. And historically, the public trust doctrine and the, the, the uh, management of our water resources, as Secretary Payne indicated, it's not a partisan issue. It's something that uh, everybody cares about from the economic benefits down to just the benefit of being able to go um, fishing or water skiing with your, your grandkid. And I think the message that needs to be delivered is, is exactly what we've been talking about today. We are losing our um, protections because we're underfunding and uh, the number of problems and the number of forces that are uh, impacting us are that much larger. So we need funding for PFAS. We need funding for aquatic invasive species. We need, we need to make sure that the surface water grant program that all of you uh, often benefit from in your lake organizations is secure and safe. And the more they hear from you, not just right now, when they're under lots of pressure to pass a budget bill that has lots of different things in it, but all of the time. So when this budget is done, in the fall, start talking to them again about the need for funding and the need for protection. But realistically, too, there is a time frame for this budget process, right? Like, suppose a year ago, this this <laughs> time wouldn't be a good time to talk about it, and a year from now would not really be a great time to talk about it. We're kind of in the midst of the biennial budget process, right? So right now is when the Joint Finance Committee is, uh, you know, has been conducting public hearings and taking testimony. Um, thinking about what they want to put in the budget. The governor has introduced um, his budget idea. The uh, legislature has, legislative leadership has indicated that that um, they'll take a look at that, but they're not feeling beholden to it and will create their own budget, which is what has happened the last couple of budget cycles. Um, so yeah, now is when these decisions are being made, but it's um, in addition to asking for the specifics now, I think, continuing to ask for the general need for this over the next two years is really important because a lot of these things we have to play the long game on and that's what builds the momentum. Great. Lynn mentioned a video and we do have one more video to watch that kind of, again, brings the public trust doctrine to life in a sense and helps educate folks. And then we'll come back and we'll ask Lynn more about the video and some of the handouts she has on the tables. So Amy, if you could cue up Lynn's video. In Wisconsin, our lakes and streams are a treasure. Healthy lakes and streams lead to wonderful times fishing, swimming, and just hanging out by the water. Water runs downhill, so what we do on the land affects the fish, water quality, and lake health. Shoreland zoning is a key tool to protect our lakes and streams for today and for future generations. When hard surfaces like homes and driveways are built farther from the shore, more trees and native plants can be kept in place to allow for a naturally stable shoreline. Clear, unpolluted water results in less algae growth and high waterfront property values. Waterfront property developed without shoreland zoning standards can degrade lakes in a number of ways. Removing trees and native plants from the shoreline results in eroded soil, more water pollution, and more algae growth. It also results in fewer frogs, fish, and other wildlife. 
If homes and other hard surfaces are built close to the shore, water runs into the lake, carrying soil and other pollutants with it. These pollutants harm fish that hunt by sight because they can't find their prey. Eroded soil also smothers fish eggs. Lawns without taller plants attract geese, which poop and increase algae blooms. When shoreland zoning is tailored to fit the different types of lakes and rivers we have in Wisconsin, it leads to careful waterfront development that keeps our lakes and rivers healthy so that we can all enjoy them. What do shoreland zoning standards accomplish? Fewer eroded and lost shorelines. Clearer water equals higher property values. More fish and more fish species and more food and shelter for fish and frogs. For more information about shoreland zoning, check with your local zoning office. For information about how to improve habitat and water quality on your shoreland property, see the Healthy Lakes and Rivers website. And talk a little bit about you know why did you put this video out? What was the what was the intent or what, what motivated this to suddenly have to happen now? Um, a number of reasons. <laughs> I came into my position twenty some years ago with a water quality water chemist background. I talked water quality, water quality, water quality. You in Wisconsin are all very polite. You sit there and you listen to water quality, and you get kind of tired. Um, I noticed that when I talked about fish, people like lit up and I was like, oh, I'm supposed to talk about fish. I've caught a few bluegills, um, but that's what I know about fish. Um, fortunately, I'm in the College of Natural Resources at UW-Stevens Point and there are a number of fisheries professors right down the hall. So I got to know some of them and they've been wonderful. Um, so I understand. Fish motivates many people as well as other wildlife. Um, so that's part of it. Part of it is realizing words aren't enough. You know, we need to see pictures, but when you've fished through many pictures, you never find exactly what you're looking for. Animation is great. You can make it do whatever you want. Um, very much based on the science, but not presented in a scientific sort of way. Um, so that was part of the drive behind it. Part of it was what you asked about earlier, Eric, you know, this resistance to shoreland zoning, resistance maybe to rules in general. Um, so explaining, why do we have it? What does it accomplish? The other piece is with waterfront development, obviously most of the time we're not seeing under the water. If you go snorkeling, you do, and it's great. Um, but I can't take y'all snorkeling. So this is another option. Um, and then lastly, because shoreland zoning was cut substantially in 2015, um, local control was taken away. Um, counties can't have higher standards, even though 54 counties voluntarily did before 2015. And so it's to bring it back around to the science of why do we have shoreland zoning? Um, as my daughter said when she was in preschool, well, mom, because water runs downhill, you know, that's kind of part of what it comes down to or a good piece of it. Um, so just trying to show that um, the postcards at your table lead to this video, share this video with whoever you think would benefit from it, you know, your lake groups, your county folks, maybe your legislators. Um, so yes, feel free to use it. There are many other resources. I'm working on some more videos to flesh this out a little bit more. Um, just as a little bit of a spoiler, one of them is going to be about walleye and how what we do on shoreland properties impacts walleye as well. Uh, Lynn, you also mentioned uh, the, the NR115 standards. NR115 is our statewide standards for zoning. And for a long time, the DNR and local partners were collaborating to 
create zoning standards that were actually more tailored to, to specific lakes through a process called lakes classification. And it's my understanding, Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong, either one of you, that it was through a budget that that power was taken away. Describe to people how that can happen. Like what, how is Wisconsin's budget unique in having these types of policy issues in them? Well, interestingly, after that year, um, there were a lot of things that were put into that budget that didn't have any relation to spending. Um, after that year, uh, le legislative leadership largely strips out the majority of those sorts of, of provisions. And I have to say on a relatively equal basis, re regardless of which party is making um, the proposals. But so what happened was um, there was the Joint Finance Committee is the uh, committee of members of both the Assembly and the Senate. They put together the final bill that will be voted on by the um, Senate and the Assembly proper. And at the, um, they have a, a whole suite of hearings um, where they pass um, motions that cover the different parts of the budget. And at the very end, they have what's called an omnibus motion. There may be a couple of them. But in 2015, in the omnibus motion, there was suddenly this provision that was added that changed all of these statutes related to shoreland zoning without any real, um, it, it, we didn't know it was coming. Um, uh, there was no, at that point, there's no opportunity for public hearing or comment on it. And it, sort of the insidious problem with having these sorts of things in budget bills is that it's a big bill that there's a lot of pressure to vote for once it gets to the floor because all of these things have been negotiated. And in the realm of the whole scope of the bill, even shoreland zoning is kind of a niche issue um, that a lot of legislators are gonna feel compelled to vote on. Um, so fortunately, we don't see that very much anymore, as I said, um, but that's kind of how that, that all came to pass historically. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I'm, I'm thinking back now to yesterday afternoon, the part that I missed of people talking about where do we go next with this? And it would seem like trying to restore some of those uh, local uh, powers, the sort of ability of a county to tailor its own regulations, seems like that should be on the agenda. Did people talk about what it would take to bring that back? I assume it's not going to come back through an omnibus budget motion, but what, what would that future look like if, if people were trying to restore uh, local power? I wasn't aware of it being talked about specifically yesterday afternoon. Um, I am going to lead a session tomorrow morning at 1045 about shoreland zoning, and that's part of what we'll talk about. Um, Representative Shankland introduced legislation last session. Technically, it's easy. You know, there are a couple lines that need to be struck from statute, and then we have local control back. Um, politically is obviously the more challenging side of that. Um, Katrina Shankland has worked across the aisle on many bills. She's hoping to do the same with this. So I think if you want to be involved in that discussion, please come join us. And I, I use the term of the, playing the long game earlier in general. And there, I think that's definitely going to be the case with this sort of legislation is it's something that we have to build momentum towards. Um, through uh, organizations locally um, talk, continuing to talk about this and continuing to bring this up. I think it was really important that there was a bill introduced last session that like gave us the, what the idea of that legislation would look like. And as Lynn said, it's very simple. Um, so, but it's going to take a lot of effort over time um, to get that to happen. I happen to think that it's really doable. It's not necessarily, um, a, again, it's not necessarily a partisan issue. The problem we have right now is sort of the, the fractured, broken politics that uh, we have in Wisconsin, not to be um, sound incredibly pessimistic right now, <laughs> but um, it's hard to get anything done with the, the state of things right now. And a lot of decisions are made not on the basis of whether it's good legislation or not, but on how that impacts the politics of the people that are pushing that legislation. And I want to add one piece. One of the things that came out of that change in the 2015 budget bill to Shoreland Zoning was many legislators said during that, I mean, it's a big bill. That's part of the issue. But part of the issue was they said, Shoreland Zoning is too complicated. We can't get our heads around Shoreland Zoning. 
So we'll just listen to whoever in our party and what their take is on shoreland zoning. Sure, there are intricacies to shoreland zoning, but part of the reason I made this video is there are basics to shoreland zoning. And if we can understand the basics and help legislators understand the basics, that we want clean water, that we want swimmable water, fishable water, and that depends on what's happening on the land. And not every lake in Wisconsin is the same. Not every stream is the same. There are different levels of sensitivity that they have to shoreland development. Um, Eric mentioned lakes classification, sorting lakes and streams according to how sensitive they are to development. The large flowages were typically the minimum standards work. It was the small pothole seepage lakes, you know, 50 acres or less. It was the trout streams that counties typically said, we need more protection there because we've seen development according to the minimum standards on those sorts of water bodies. And it's not good. They're degraded within a few years. Michael Kane, I wanna have you reflect on maybe where green fire goes next with respect to the public trust doctrine. What is on your, your near-term horizon or what are the plans for the organization around this issue? Well, one of the things that we're uh, involved in is public education um, and outreach, and we're trying to talk to as many people we can about this. Um, you know, we are, uh, we strive to be nonpartisan. And I think, you know, as a, as a lifelong Wisconsin citizen and as a person who's worked on these issues a, a lot of years, when I retired from the department, I was asked to give a, a talk to the environmental section of the state bar. And I went and looked at a book called Protectors of Land and Waters, Environmentalism in Wisconsin by Thomas Huffman. He talked about the creation of the Department of Natural Resources in 1967. And Governor Warren Knowles is the person who put together the Kellett Commission and, and they decided to organize the department. And at the first Natural Resources board meeting, Knowles said, Governor Knowles uh, said, quote, he contended that the agency embodied, quote, the ecological conscience of Aldo Leopold and that it had begun a new era in the history of resource management. Um, I was a lawyer at the department when the U.S. Supreme Court um, issued a decision that said that there was a million acres of wetlands that were going to be not protected under federal law because they were isolated. At that time, we had a Democratic Senate, a Republican Assembly, and a Republican governor, and we got a, a bill through the legislature unanimously in both houses, um, and the governor signed that said that those things that were declared non-federal would be protected under Wisconsin law. Um, it is possible in Wisconsin, looking back, uh, for all of us to look at these resource issues and say, we need to work together. It's happened. I hope we can get back to the day when that happens again. And so that's one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons I'm with Green Fire, and that's one of the reasons that all of us, uh, we now have 810 members. We're working to try to, to bring science to the table, bring engineering to the table, and try to talk to all people to say, um, you know, Wisconsin needs to do this. It's something important. So it's, we hope to play a role in that. So if a lake organization wanted to hear from Greenfire at a meeting, say about just a, an explanation of the public trust doctrine, because they may not feel like they're experts on the subject, you all might be available to, to come to meetings. Like there, there's people like yourself and others who can- We, we might, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're retired, we're volunteering our time, uh, but we would love to, uh, we do have members all over the state, including members who, a lot of members who have knowledge about this issue, but yes, contact us and we'll do the best we can. And I think part of what I'm hoping would happen is as a result of these videos that were shared, that you all feel free to share those as well, to take them back to your lake organization, post them on your Facebook page, include the links and emails that you might send out to your groups, put them in the newsletter. These videos only have an impact if people actually watch them. And so our challenge now is to get it out into the world and get more people seeing these and trying to begin their, their, their educational journey around the public trust doctrine. I'm noting the time and we, I think, have eaten up the entire block for the plenary session. Um, I do want to ask everybody to, again, thank our panelists for sharing their information. And I will release them from the stage. I maybe have time for just a couple of quick slides with reminders for what's coming up next in the convention. Um, we are gonna be basically taking just a few minutes to get to your next sessions. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the event Moby, Moby Ma app. Um, you can learn more about this at the registration area. 
So talk to them about making sure you can see the agenda on your phone. Please also take time to contribute to the memory wall and the collaborative art project up by the front door. And if you have not yet signed up for the banquet, there still is just a little bit of time to do that, but you'd have to go to the registration area. And chapter 33 will be having its 50th anniversary next year, and we plan to celebrate that in style. So please plan ahead accordingly. Thank you, and we'll see you at the next session, which starts in, I believe, 10 minutes.